All right, so let's start with the tennis ball one. It's the easiest one. Um, and um, I would encourage you to write the things down that I'm not going to write down because um, um, I'm still a little jittery from this morning. But let's say that uh, this one, the goal is for you to find the impulse experienced by the tennis ball. That's what I want you to do. And there's two ways to find impulse, if you'll recall. Uh, I, would, I would hope that you would know which of these two methods you're gonna have to use, because we talked a little bit about it already. So um, we don't know anything about how long the ball was in contact with the ground. That makes that one impossible. So we're looking at this one. That's the way you're gonna do it. And that's just gonna be M V final minus M which, yes, might require that you go get the mass of a tennis ball sometime before you turn this in. The tennis ball started from some, we'll say, starting height, and then it recoiled off the ground to some recoil, recoil height. You need to figure out how fast the ball was going when it reached the ground because this is the initial velocity of the ball. And then you need to figure out how fast the ball left the ground because that will be the final velocity of the ball. You have a variety of methods that you could use to do this. We've learned three. I would probably say the fastest one is conservation of energy. That you could use the conservation of energy to figure out the final velocity and conservation of energy to figure out the initial velocity. Yeah, I'm both. And then once you do, that's all you have to worry about. You have two sets of data, one's from a higher spot, one's from a lower spot. Um, I want to, you to compare the two impulses and see if they're the same or different. They should be different, but you'll see. All right? Any question about what I'm expecting you to do here? Um, let's do this one next. This one is fraught with problems. So if you didn't take your data correctly, um, you might have some difficulty. So let's talk about the data that you need to collect here. You should have a collection of dots on the ground where the ball struck the ground without there being any collision at all. That occurred during a time when you were releasing the ball from the ramp, like so. So we have the table, and the ground, and the ramp was up here, like that. So when you release the ball here, it left the table with some um, some velocity. Uh, if it were a projectile problem, I would have called this Vx. But I want to call it V-naught on purpose because on the floor, I'm going to refer to things in X and Y because it's two-dimensional. So this is just the initial velocity of the ball, but it was perfectly horizontal. That's the way the ramp was designed. If you remember projectiles, if you know this height, you can figure out how long it took the ball to reach the ground. And we know the ball is going to track some path to the ground. So by measuring this distance, the range, you could figure out VO by doing range divided by T. However, the height is the same for all of the balls. So you'll be dividing all of the ranges by t, and t is the same number for all of the ranges. So we're going to ignore that, meaning we're just going to compare the ranges and say that that's the same as comparing the velocities. You understand? Because it's still the same comparison. Also, to get momentum, it's mv. So we would have to actually multiply all those velocities by m 
but since you use the same mass ball for both balls, again, we don't really need to worry about multiplying by the mass. As long as we compare the ranges, we are comparing the momentums. Does everybody understand? Or at least, can everybody obey? So we're gonna compare the ranges. But you need to be able to say in your lab how comparing the ranges is the same as comparing the momentums. You should mention both things. <coughs> that the range can be used to find the velocity, but it's the same time for all the balls. And the momentum requires the mass, but it's the same mass for all the balls. If you mention that, then you're allowed to just compare the ranges. So let's talk about the comparisons you need to make for the ranges. The first range you have is the range where there was no collision. Draw a line from the point directly below the drop to the center of the circle of all of the hits on the paper, right? It made like a, a bunch of hits. Draw a circle around those hits and draw this line from the, cent from the point directly below the drop to the center of that circle. Call this, or I'm gonna call this R naught. And I'm also gonna indicate that this is the y direction and this is the x direction. So once you've done that, then find your two targets when there was a collision. And you're gonna have one to the right and one to the left. Now, this part's a little bit tough. Take and draw a triangle, a right triangle for each. Now, you need to measure R to the right in the x direction and R to the right in the y direction. And then you also need to measure R to the left in the y direction and R to the left in the x direction. Does that make sense? You're gonna measure those parts of the triangle because this is ultimately our left, and this is ultimately our right. Now, momentum is supposed to be conserved. For momentum to be conserved, there was only momentum in the y direction before the collision. So let's consider the y direction and the x direction. In the y direction, the original momentum was R naught. In the x direction, the original momentum was zero because the ball was just traveling in the y direction. After the collision, the momentum of the ball in the y direction is R to the right in the y direction plus R to the left in the y direction. The two balls carry away the momentum in the y direction. In the x direction, we know that the two balls are to the right in the x direction plus r to the left in the x direction. Those should cancel out because there should be no momentum in the x direction. Your job is to see if that is true. You're gonna make a comparison. Now, what is a mathematical way to determine how far apart the numbers are? Do you guys know? Okay, because I said this in the class in the second period, and they're all like, oh yeah, we know exactly how to do that. I would do a percent difference. Do you know how to calculate percent difference? No. If not, I can tell you. But if you do know, I won't have to waste the time. 
How many of you would like me to talk about how to calculate? Okay. So we're trying to see how far apart this number is from this sum. I want to see how far apart, what percent difference are they? So it's not too hard to do. We're going to take r naught and subtract the sum. This is how different the two numbers are. We'll need to uh, take the absolute value of that because we don't care whether it's positive or negative. We're just trying to figure out how far apart it is. Then, this one's going to be harder. You need to divide by the average of those two things. So I want to write the word average, but after you get this sum, you find the average between these two things. And then write this as a percentage. I would say if they're different by less than 5%, you've shown conservation of momentum in the y direction. The percentage I'm picking out is arbitrary. If you take statistics, it'll help you pick a better percentage, one that has more meaning. Because part of what you do in statistics is to determine whether two numbers are statistically different or not. Um, it's harder to do this one because there's a zero in there. To deal with the zero, recognize these two numbers need to be equal and opposite. Does that make sense? So to compare them, just take their absolute value and subtract them, and then take the absolute value of that. You want to see how far apart they are. And then divide by their average. And that, too, convert to a percentage. If you want to see if momentum was conserved in the x direction, this percentage should be 0 or less. Find average. Let's do this one first. Uh, average of two numbers is just add the absolute values and divide by the number of numbers. Um, for this one, be careful because it's going to be add these two numbers. and then divide by 2, because this is considered one number, and this is considered one number. Does that make sense? All right. As I'll say, that's what goes here. All right, you guys feel good about all that? All right. Well, that is the average, so yes. Like you did for this, where you just take the two vat, the two one for each car, and do that to find. Okay, let's talk about this one. And boy, let me tell you, you guys think you had trouble? Second period was a disaster here. They just couldn't figure it out. It's not hard. Was it hard? I don't know. Second period was just rough. And I'm even recording that, so if they listen, mm -hmm. good. Um, let's, let's make up one of the possibilities. How about yellow car hit green car? Fair enough. If yellow car hit green car, then your graph should have looked, if we ignore the part where you push the car, then yellow car has some velocity, hits the green car, and maybe still has velocity, but it's less. There are several possibilities. It could have bounced back, in which its velocity would be negative. Um, they couldn't stick together because there was no Velcro to cause the car to stick together. Uh, it could have stopped. I mean, that's possible. But then green car started from rest. And then after the collision, something like that. Good so far? You're trying to see if you demonstrated conservation of momentum. Well, this is the initial velocity of the yellow car. This is the initial velocity of the green car. This is the final velocity of the yellow car. This is the final velocity of the green car. The mass of a car was 286 grams. 
although you may have added mass to the cars. You're trying to test if M V final plus M V final is equal to M V initial plus M V initial. And let's just uh, color code this real quick. To understand, I'm talking about the yellow and the car. Um, again, if you want to see if they are statistically the same, do another percent difference calculation with this being compared with this. Is that okay? All good? All right. Um, you have three of those, don't you? With one of them being the cars exploding, the exploding one is going to be a little more difficult because you'll have a zero. There was zero velocity before the explosion, and then there will be two velocities after the explosion. So you can still do a percent difference calculation. You just do a difference. Also, however, you had this. Now you have a graph that looks like that. I want you to see if the two impulses are the same. To see if the two impulses are the same, you're going to measure the area and multiply that area by the mass. This will be net force times time. So to do that, you get the mass of the car times the area under the graph. This isn't a force graph, so because it's not a force graph, I can't, um, you know, it's not giving you the impulse directly. It's an area graph, it's, you know, it's an acceleration graph. But if you multiply the acceleration by the mass, you get a force graph. So I want you to do that for both sides. And then compare the two impulses. So you're going to find impulse for the green car and then impulse for the yellow car, and then compare them. You have three of those to compare. So any question about what I'm asking for for this portion of the, the lab? All right, this one's a lot of work and this is actually a problem I wanted to talk about today because it is a lot of work. So I need to go over a whole bunch of things related to this problem, but we're going to treat this a little different. Um, you have data for it, and the data is just it's not going to work out great. The apparatus is garbage, and um, I'm unhappy with it. But it's what they sent me last year, so I'm going to use it till it breaks, and I hope it breaks soon because I don't like it. So I'll just throw that at you. But um, I tried to order the nice one, uh, but they sent me that instead. It's not the nice one. So it's just terrible. So I'm, I'm trying to order the nice one again because I like the nice one. But that, that's, they said that that one is deluxe. It is not deluxe. Um, in fact, I might just build one. I could probably build one better than that. But this is the problem. This is called a ballistic pendulum. That's what this is called. And I want you to know that name, Ballistic Pendulum. This is a very prevalent problem in AP Physics C, but it has, it's shown up on AP Physics 1. It is a combination conservation of momentum and conservation of energy problem. It's a combination of those. It is conservation of momentum from here to here because there's a collision. But after the collision, it's a conservation of energy problem.
as, gravita as kinetic energy after the collision is converted into gravitational potential energy while the combination of the hammer and the ball swing upwards. It's you figuring out problems like this and knowing when to apply conservation of momentum and when to apply conservation of energy that you are going to be tricked about. That's what they're going to try and trick you into. So the collision, as I said before, is just the part where the ball hit the hammer. It's the instantaneous moment before contact and the instantaneous moment after contact. Because the moment contact is made and the pendulum starts to swing upwards, the external force of gravity starts slowing down the pendulum and momentum is no longer conserved. So energy is not conserved here because it's an inelastic collision and momentum is not conserved here. There's so many styles of this problem. There's this version. There's the version where this thing isn't being hung on a pendulum, but is connected to a spring, and a spring is compressed. There's, there's just a lot of different versions, and you're responsible for knowing when momentum is conserved and when energy is conserved, and when one problem ends and when the other problem begins. So the momentum problem ends the moment the ball is in the pendulum. That's, that's what we need to know. And that's when the energy problem begins. So we know that this is what occurs after the collision. But before the collision, we have mass of the ball times the initial velocity of the ball. And that's the only thing that's moving. So the mass of the pendulum is got a velocity of zero. But after the collision, it's the mass of the ball plus the mass of the pendulum times their final velocity. This is the momentum problem. What I want you to do in this lab is figure out how fast the ball was shot from the spring launcher. You're trying to find this number. Yep. So, if you put mass of ball plus mass of the water pendulum. Oh, well, Mr. Shelton should be a better teacher. Thank you for correcting me and helping me be better today. Now, I want to be clear. This mass right here refers to this mass because it is the ball and the pendulum that swing upwards. But over there, that mass will cancel out. Good so far? Now, it seems to me that if you have H, you could use that to figure out how fast the pendulum and ball were traveling and if you have how fast the pendulum and ball are traveling, you could use that to figure out how fast the ball was going. You will need these masses, and I'll provide you with those two masses. I have to measure the, the pendulum. There's a problem, though. You don't have the height. You have an angle. An angle is different than the height. You need to figure out how to get the height from the angle. So knowing what your um, trig skills have been so far, I thought perhaps I could help you with that. I would strongly encourage you memorize what we're about to do, or at least the result. I'm going to do this nice and big so it's easy to see.
All right, so nice and easy to see. First, can we agree that that length and that length are the same? Because it's the length of the pendulum. I'm going to draw a horizontal line there. Now this line is perpendicular right here. Okay, so I just drew a horizontal line. And this is the angle that you guys measured. Now, I'm just going to do a little bit of trig. Um, this side is the adjacent side of a right triangle. Do you see the right triangle? Let me, let me make sure because I'm, I'm, I'm seeing some confusion. Well, that didn't work. There, you see the right triangle now, right? That's the right triangle I'm trying to identify. Well, based on that right triangle, cosine, cosine theta equals A over L. So that adjacent side equals L cosine theta. All good, you follow that? Well, this is H. That's how high the mass was lifted. Do you see why that has to be true? So H plus A equals L. Just looking at that right there. Do you see that okay? So substitute. And I get H plus L cosine theta equals L. So H equals L minus L cosine theta. That's worth memorizing, but after telling this all to you, what measurement do you need that you don't have? Well, I know you don't have H, but you're going to calculate H. You need L. That's right, you don't have L. 